All right, well, uh, let's begin. My name's Adam White. I'm a research fellow here at the Hoover Institution. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to the Johnson Center, the Hoover Institution's outpost in Washington, D.C. Uh, one of the many things we do here at this office is a series we call Opening Arguments, uh, Conversations on American Constitutionalism, where we invite scholars and policymakers and others to discuss uh, self-governance and constitutionalism in the broadest possible terms. Obviously, we tend to think of that first and foremost uh, in terms of the courts, uh, but also we like to discuss it in terms of the other parts of government and just among the people themselves. Uh, and so it's my great pleasure to welcome today's speaker, who, while a law professor, writes very broadly uh, in a variety of forums and always with an eye not just to the courts, but also to the other institutions of governance and self-government. His name is Justin Driver. Professor Driver is the Harry N. Wyatt Professor of Law at the University of Chicago Law School, where he teaches and writes on constitutional law. His legal scholarships appeared in the Yale Law Journal, the University of Chicago Law Review, and other prominent journals. But as I mentioned, Professor Driver also writes for a much broader public audience in the Washington Post, the Atlantic, the New Republic, and Slate. And now he's published this inspiring and impressive book that we're discussing today, The Schoolhouse Gate, the Public Education, the Supreme Court, and the Battle for the American Mind. Uh, quite bluntly, Justin, uh, who I'll, I'll admit is one of my law school classmates, um, is one of the nation's most thought-provoking and interesting writers on the courts, the Constitution, and democracy. So it's a great honor and pleasure to invite him here today. Please join me in welcoming Professor Driver. I'm so glad to be with you all here today and with my law school classmate. The truth is, Adam and I didn't know each other all that well. <laughs> Harvard is a big place. Um, there are 550 people per class, but I have followed Adam's writing with admiration uh, since we graduated, and I'm delighted to be here with you that's, today. That's very kind of you. We'll get out, uh, now we've gotten past the mutual admiration <laughs> part of the conversation. Um, let's begin with the book's title, The Schoolhouse Gate. Uh, that's a reference to a famous Supreme Court case, right? Yes. So the title comes from a dispute in Des Moines, Iowa in the 1960s where students want to wear black armbands in protest of the Vietnam War. And uh, school officials get wind of this and say, oh, no, that's too hot of a topic. Uh, you know, there was a graduate of Des Moines schools who died over in Vietnam, and he still has friends here who are in the public schools. And if you wear these black armbands, uh, they're going to take it as though you are dishonoring his memory and his legacy. And so this, is, this happens in December of 1965. It's worth saying this is long before any sort of mass mobilization against the Vietnam War exists. And uh, it's an open question as to whether this violates their freedom of speech. The students are told that they are going to be uh, not allowed to return to school until they take off the armbands. And you know, one of the important parts of the book is the way that there are these litigants who are students and their families who are standing up not only against school officials oftentimes, but against their larger communities. And so the Tinker household, right, the students, Mary Beth Tinker and John Tinker, uh, it was splattered with red paint on a front door. And the evident implication here was that only a communist, a red, would dare to oppose the Vietnam War. So Justice Fortas writes this, in my view, magnificent opinion, where he says, it can hardly be argued that students shed their constitutional rights at the schoolhouse gate. And interestingly, though, uh, at the time, uh, the decision comes down in 1969, most Americans would have disagreed with that idea. I found polling data to this effect. Uh, and so the argument very much could be had. Uh, you know, Justice Hugo Black wrote a dissenting opinion where he's fairly sort of frothing at the mouth. He speaks from the bench for more than 20 minutes in order to express his deep disagreement with the opinion. Uh, and uh, he was so sort of angry that Chief Justice Warren is purported to have said, you know, old Hugo really got caught up in his jockstrap on yeah. that one. Yeah, and I mean, Hugo Black was no First Amendment slouch generally, but there was something he saw as just different about that case. Now, the way you recited the famous line from the opinion about shedding constitutional rights at the schoolhouse gate, but as you note in your book, um, the way we always quote that case, there's an ellipsis in there, right? 
they say uh, they say the constitutional rights, including the First Amendment. Or, yes, or, yeah, that's um, right. And teachers and students, they say, uh, right, or constitutional rights to freedom of expression. Right, but because of what comes after Tinker, and we'll discuss that, it becomes very, it, be, it becomes very straightforward in, in in shortening the quote because now we understand sort of more fully uh, the the role of of constitutional rights in the schools. But before Tinker, it's a much different story. And we'll get to that in just a moment. But before we get to anything else, I want to talk, I just want to ask, how did you come about this book project? What was it that inspired you to write this book? Yeah, so this book took me either four years to write or three decades to write, depending upon how you think about this. I grew up in Washington, D.C., just a stone's throw from where we are right now. Uh, I grew up in southeast D.C., east of the Anacostia River, and starting at a very young age, starting in the fifth grade, I traveled from far southeast to way upper northwest Washington. Uh, that required me to get on a bus and two different subway lines and a long walk over in Cleveland Park. And so this was a long journey, and I didn't have a whole lot to do during this time, but I started thinking about what am I gaining as a result of this daily journey? And conversely, what are my neighbors not gaining as a result of going to the local schools? And um, I remember you know, learning about Brown versus Board of Education right around 1985 or so and thinking, well, there are some, you know, many, all black schools within shouting distance of the Supreme Court's Marble Palace. And it made me think there's often a big gap between law on the books and life on the streets. And so I started thinking about these issues for a really long time. And when I graduated from college, I thought that I was going to be a public school teacher. I got certified to teach public school uh, at a program at Duke. And as part of that program, I taught history and civics in a high school. And so one of the goals of the book is to try to render in an accessible way you know, the origins of students' constitutional rights the contours of those constitutional rights, and then offer my normative views for how they should change. Really, the second of those is perhaps the most important in the sense that I want to explain in a clear way what the contours of students' constitutional rights are in a way that is accessible to non-lawyers. When I was working in a public school, I had only a pretty vague sense as to what the content of these rights actually are. And so I think that there are lots of teachers and school administrators that are out there who uh, want to be able to access this material. And I, th I think this really comes through in the book, your perspective as not just a student and then later as a teacher and as a journalist and as a, uh, as a, as a legal scholar. But how would you, if you had to, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big book and it's very nuanced, but if you were to sum up the core argument of the book, what would it be? Yeah, so the core argument is that it's an examination of two important American institutions, the public school on the one hand and the Supreme Court on the other. And I contend that it's difficult, if not impossible, to understand the one institution without thinking about the other. So with respect to how the Supreme Court has shaped the nation's public schools, we don't often think about public schools as being legal institutions. but they are. The Supreme Court has interpreted the Constitution to apply uh, a whole host of constitutional provisions uh, exist within the public schools that offer students protection. And they offer protection in ways that are different than when students are in, say, the public park across the street after school. Uh, and so that's, that's one. You know, there's freedom of speech, of course, due process. Think about equal protection. Uh, the religion clauses, both with respect to uh, the free exercise clause and the establishment clause. So there are just many different constitutional provisions that are out there uh, that, that, that exist in public schools in particular forms. And then I also contend that it's helpful to think about the Supreme Court's role in American society by looking at education decisions. Um, I, unlike many of my fellow people in the academy, uh, believe that the Supreme Court has uh, an important role to play in American society and that it has demonstrated a capacity for issuing decisions that vindicate minority rights um, and that it can be efficacious in that effort. Um, and so that's a relatively unusual position in the academy today. Uh, and I use these education cases to illustrate that larger phenomena. Now you and I are both, as we were discussing right before, we're both admirers of Professor Alex Bickle, and he saw in some ways the Supreme Court playing an educational role in the country as a whole. 
Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of that that comes through in this book, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, in, in staking out your claim, I, I quote, I wrote this down in my notes, but at the outset of the book you say that public schools are the single most significant site of constitutional interpretation within the nation's history. That's a, that's a pretty... It's a pretty bold claim. I mean, there's a lot of, you know, we could think about the police, we could think about all other aspects of, of governance where people and their civil liberties meet government power. Why the schools? Yeah, so it is a bold claim, uh, but I think it's one that uh, is defensible. And the place to begin is thinking about the magnitude of the nation's public schools. There are more than 50 million uh, students in the nation's public schools and it takes a few million of adults to administer and run the public schools and that means that on any given school day that roughly one-sixth of the American population is in public schools and importantly it is the first sustained exposure that most people in the United States are going to have to a governmental entity. So that's one reason, just the, the magnitude. The second reason that I would emphasize um, is the way that disputes that begin in the public schools are often reflective of larger cultural anxieties that exist in the nation. And so if you think about the debate about racial equality in the 1950s, going back even before that, you could, Brown versus Board of Education, of course, going back earlier, you can think about anxieties about immigration in the 1920s dealing with uh, you know, prohibitions on people teaching in languages other than English in the Meyer versus Nebraska case. Uh, you could flash forward, of course, to the 1980s and thinking about uh, the way that people are concerned about youth culture and uh, illicit content and the Frazier speech dealing with the freedom of speech. And so I argue that these cases offer a particularly vivid prism for understanding larger, uh, the larger sweep of American history. But always with that extra wrinkle or nuance that it's the unique uh, the unique uh, context of schools, yeah. which in some ways takes all of these broader societal and constitutional issues and takes them through the lens or filter of the additional responsibilities of, of the educational environment. That's exactly right, and in many ways I'm inspired by Justice Jackson's decision in the Barnett case from the 1940s where there are Jehovah's Witnesses who wish not to recite the Pledge of Allegiance. And, uh, of course, there was a decision in Gobitis three years earlier where they say that it's permissible to expel Jehovah's Witnesses for refusing to salute the American flag. And Jackson writes this magnificent opinion uh, where he reconceives of the cases involving not so much the freedom of religion, but instead the freedom of speech. And he says that the freedom of speech has a corollary right not to speak, um, and he says that it's especially important for us to honor constitutional rights within the schools uh, because if we don't, we're going to teach young people uh, that constitutional principles are mere platitudes. And he says we risk strangling the free mind at its source. That's incredibly evocative and powerful language. Uh, and I think that Jackson's right to suggest that it's an especially vital uh, institution for honoring constitutional rights. Yeah, you point out that Jackson is, was widely known as one of the court's best writers in the history of the court, and Barnett may well be his, his best written opinion. Now, before we get to the, to the free speech cases, let's just go back a little bit to the prehistory. You start the book by discussing this trilogy of cases where the court, as you say, crosses a threshold from being very hands-off with public schools to being more engaged uh, with or engaged at all with what's happening in public schools. Now, three cases are Meyer versus Nebraska, Pierce versus Society of Sisters. Um, Meyer, Meyer v. Nebraska is the, the case in which the, the court said that the local community could not prohibit the teaching of a foreign language uh, in, in, in the school, mm -hmm. German, in the context mm -hmm. of World War I. Mm -hmm. Pierce versus Society of Sisters, where they, the court holds that the, the local government cannot uh, prohibit uh, private schools mm -hmm. alongside the public schools as, a, as a, it involved, as the name Pierce versus Society of Sisters indicates, it involved Catholic schools. Um, I'm a product of the Catholic schools myself, and it's a case I've given a lot of thought to. And then the third case, I have to admit, this is one that I did not know of, and you, mm -hmm. you, you say in, the, in your book it's sort of a lost case. Mm -hmm. It's called Farrington versus mm -hmm. 
Tokushige? Sure, I say Takashige. Takashige. And yeah. it, so could you just sum up very briefly what it was that the court did in, as you say, crossing the threshold in these three cases? Yeah, so this trilogy of cases is an important one from the 1920s. And uh, exactly as Adam suggested, before then there were a couple of cases involving constitutional claims involving education. And the court would very quickly turn these away and say, no, this is an educational matter that is a quintessentially local endeavor, and states and localities should be able to do whatever they wish. Here, the, in all three of these cases, the state is limiting education in some way, but overwhelmingly going to private schools and private education, right? This is a Catholic school in Pierce versus Society of Sisters, um, where there is a referendum that Oregonians pass saying that you can abolish private schools and parochial schools. And this was a referendum that was pushed by the Ku Klux Klan at the time. And they believed that Catholic schools uh, were preventing people from becoming sufficiently Americanized, right? Mm -hmm. And the court steps in in Pierce versus Society of Sisters in an opinion by Justice McReynolds and says famously, the child is not the mere creature of the state. And so this trilogy of cases is they're not entering the public school yet, but they are signaling that the state does not have unfettered discretion to be able to uh, run education however it wishes. And it's my argument that those cases then set the scene for the court's decision in Barnett just a few years later. And those cases are so interesting because at first they're conceiving of these rights in terms of rights of the family, right? mm -hmm. almost more rights of the parents mm -hmm. than the right of the actual student until mm -hmm. later. Mm -hmm. And second, the court is grappling with where to situate these rights, right? This is just a couple of decades after the, the famous Lochner case, mm -hmm. where progressives pushed back, or where, where well, um, progressives in dissent criticized the majority of the Supreme Court for asserting constitutional rights based on the 14th Amendment uh, mm -hmm. concept of liberty. And Pierce versus Society of Sisters is basically a 14th Amendment individual liberty case. Mm -hmm. And it's only in the later cases, which I guess we can turn to now, where the court starts locating and grappling with specific rights within the Constitution, beginning really with the First Amendment mm -hmm. in the flag saluting cases. So you mentioned Gobitis, where the court initially says, we're not going to strike down uh, flag salute uh, requirements. Um, but then in Barnett, it changes course. Mm -hmm. Right, so what happened? Yeah, so in, uh, there was an enormous outcry after the Gobitis decision in 1940, uh, where there is lots of violence that is visited upon Jehovah's Witnesses and their families. And interestingly to me, at least, at the time of the Gobitis decision in 1940, schools in 15 different states were expelling Jehovah's Witnesses. But three years later, at the time of Barnett, schools in all 48 states were expelling Jehovah's Witnesses. And this case is Barnett's in 1943, the height of World War II. And you can imagine patriotic sentiment was running incredibly high. Indeed, there were flag stores in New York City that could not keep the item in stock. Uh, and nevertheless, Justice Jackson issues this opinion that's defending uh, you know, minority rights at a time when uh, elites would have viewed Barnett as correctly decided. Uh, but many non-elites would have thought, of course you can require people to salute the American flag. Justice Frankfurter uh, wrote the opinion in Gobitis and wrote a vehement dissent in uh, Barnett where he says, uh, national unity is the basis of national security. And uh, of course, schools need to be able to do this. Uh, Justice Jackson uh, just wrote, as, as I said, this magnificent opinion. There are lots of lines that I could quote to you. But one of them is, right, if there's any fixed star in our constitutional constellation, it is that no official high or petty can prescribe which shall be orthodox. Uh, and that's a beautiful sentence in my view. And uh, President Eisgruber of Princeton has suggested, I think quite persuasively, that what Jackson's doing there is he's almost appealing to our sense of patriotism mm -hmm. 
as he says, it is uh, un-American to require people to salute the American flag. And so the evidence for that proposition, any fixed star, right, thinking about the American flag and its stars yeah. in our constitutional constellation. So, and, and the that, opinion came out on Flag Day. On Flag Day, yeah. that's exactly right. And it was incredibly efficacious, again. Schools around the country were expelling students one day, and then more or less overnight, they stopped expelling students. And it was important, probably, that Jackson said, this is a right that, in effect, uh, protects not only Jehovah's Witnesses, but those who, because of their freedom of conscience, uh, wish not to salute the American flag. And this is a really important case for me because this is what we think of as the prohibition on compulsory speech. And of course, that is a decision that is not confined to the schools, but exists throughout American society. So many of you all would have studied uh, the case involving the New Hampshire license plate case, thinking about live free or die, which right. is struck down on this same sort of ground. Now, we keep throwing around names like Jackson, Black, Frankfurter. What's interesting is in this era, in the mid-20th century, these are all debates that are happening on the court basically among justices who come from the same, more or less the same political background. Most of them are appointed by Franklin Roosevelt. Mm -hmm. um, and you get these deep cleavages within that otherwise similar sort of political family mm -hmm. over these issues of the balance to be struck between individual liberty and the power of the state. Mm -hmm. right. That's exactly right. And I think that uh, one of the important lines of cleavage here is there uh, certainly in the 1940s was anxiety about the role of the Supreme Court with respect to education. Uh, there's a strong idea that Supreme Court justices are not teachers, and so how are they to know uh, how to regulate schools? And so there's a certain fear uh, that they are going to regulate something that they don't know anything about. Jackson has an answer to that, and he says that we cannot, because of modest estimates of our competence, shirk our constitutional responsibility. And I find that to be a very powerful argument. When you step back and think about it, I claim well, Supreme Court justices may not be teachers, but they know a lot more about teaching than they know about many other areas that they're regulating. I would say they know more about schools than they know about being a police officer that's working a bead or even thinking about antitrust and running a business and these sorts of things. So if we start right. down that road, uh, it seems to me that the Supreme Court's jurisdiction would, would right. shrink pretty dramatically. Right. So, so the court does start engaging these cases, first and foremost, really with speech. And so you dedicate a, a, a substantial section of the book to just walking through a lot of the free speech cases. And it's interesting, over and over again, the court will enter the arena of this issue. And even where they strike down a school policy or a local or state law, they often do it uh, sort of uh, in a very limited way. Or in the aftermath of the decision, people start to understand that what the court has done sometimes isn't as much as they think it would be. And that's a theme throughout the book. Mm -hmm. But just a couple of the cases that you touch on um, in the case, uh, or sorry, in the book, you talk about a case called Bethel, where a student gave a speech full of sexual innuendo. Um, it was a school campaign speech, and it's sort of the same, the, the kind of innuendo you'd expect a 13-year-old boy to make in a campaign <laughs> speech. And so the school tries to, the school punishes it, um, and the, the justices really grapple with with how exactly to line up a First Amendment analysis on this, and to what extent should they defer to the school's judgment sort of on the spot. And you refer to this as one of the most vexing First Amendment cases involving students. Yeah. And then later you talk about a case, um, Hazelwood, involving a, the school, you know, the official student newspaper, um, and the question about the extent to which, was it the school principal, I guess? Mm -hmm. Yes. Basically veto what was in... What, 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 was, uh, what was in the paper, and how did the court end up coming out in that case? Yeah, so the, there were a couple of articles that were in something called the Spectrum newspaper, the school newspaper in St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, they involved issues of teenage pregnancy and divorce, and the school principal, in his capacity, in effect, as editor-in-chief of the newspaper, decided to pull the articles. Uh, the students were anticipating a six-page newspaper, and instead they got a four-page newspaper. And the principal's explanation for pulling the articles I found to be 
uh, illogical uh, and just completely wrong-headed. Uh, there were uh, several uh, sort of profiles of young women who got pregnant and sort of said, I didn't think it could happen to me, or you know, we only had sex one time, and I didn't think you could, you could get pregnant on the first time. And the principal objected because he said there were too many distinguishing details about these young women and their identities would be revealed. Mm -hmm. uh, people, these were not merely people who became pregnant, but they had the children. And so the idea that their identities were secret strikes me as incoherent. And what could be a more important message for a school newspaper than dealing with you know, teen sexuality and its effects? Um, and so, uh, you know, and similarly with respect to divorce, this is in the 1980s at a time where divorce rates are skyrocketing. There were these touching quotes from the students saying, you know, at first I thought it was my fault, and then I realized it wasn't. So the, the principal got rid of these articles, did not tell them, and I think that was wrong-headed. I nevertheless also claim, though, uh, that the court correctly decided that it was within the school's principal, uh, to, with, his, with his prerogative, to not publish the, sp the speech. Uh, so the court did so in a very convoluted analysis. I think that the more logical approach would be to re regard this as part of the government speech doctrine, where the government can say what it wishes to say when it's speaking through its official organ. Right, so if this were sort of a, a, like an underground student newspaper, that would be very different from the one that's actually published by the school itself. Uh, indeed, I encourage the students to publish their ideas to the underground newspaper. I should also say that it's bad as a matter of policy, generally speaking, for school principals to use their authority in this way. And what often happens is that the newspaper articles get more attention uh, than they would have otherwise. Indeed, these articles were published in the St. Louis newspaper right. uh, under a headline, Too Hot for Hazelwood. That was the uh, name of the school, Hazelwood East. Uh, and so you end up getting more attention for these sorts of things. So again, I do not like the principal's approach here, but I do think that it raises serious First Amendment issues if you view uh, student uh, journalists as being able to publish whatever they want. After all, the, I mean, many people would say, of course, there needs to be some editor-in-chief and some adult supervision. But then, if you import the First Amendment analysis, that would seem to be a prior restraint. Mm -hmm. And you know, just as Woodward and Bernstein would not have had a free speech claim had Catherine Graham uh, said, I'm not publishing your stories on Watergate, yeah. uh, it seems to me that the principal was in a similar position here. Yeah, but if Woodward and Bernstein had been writing out for the Washington Post, but for, say, the, the Army Times, right. it would be a different situation. Ex exactly yeah. so. Yeah. Um, and so in Hazelwood, the way the court grapples with the case, is they talk about it in terms of the school's educational mission, I, I think, mm -hmm. right? And, and, mm -hmm. and again, there's that, that, that pull between the, the, the students having the, 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 these basic First Amendment rights uh, and the opposite sort of interest of the school in promoting a specific educational mission mm -hmm. and pulling students to, uh, uh, you know, through the things that the school thinks they're supposed to learn. It was interesting when you said a moment ago that Justice Jackson and Barnett said, you know, no, it, you know, no government official can can prescribe orthodoxy. Well, in some ways, that's what the school does every day mm -hmm. on, on some matters. Mm -hmm. um, of course, you know, the, the orthodoxy of math, mathematics is different from, say, the orthodoxy of political views, but but the school has has both the challenge of teaching certain things and, and sometimes even prescribing some values. On the other hand, leaving space for the students to mm -hmm. to learn and, mm -hmm. and again to be have their own individual rights mm -hmm. and yeah. identity. That's exactly right. And there's a real tension in this area that comes out in the Tinker case, perhaps most prominently, where Justice Fortas, writing for the majority, and Justice Black, writing in dissent. Uh, both believe that the schools are responsible for creating citizens, uh, but they have radically different conceptions of the way to foster good citizenship. Uh, Justice Fortas, writing for the majority, says that students disagreeing with one another is an important part of the American enterprise itself. Mm -hmm. Fortas says ours is a relatively open, often disputatious society, and it would be odd, in effect, if our schools were to be enclaves of totalitarianism. He uses that terminology. Uh, that, you know, just where students are, in effect, receptacles that teachers are filling with knowledge. Justice Black uh, argues quite uh, you know, forcefully that, no, these are young people 
and students are there uh, to be, in effect, seen and not heard, and uh, you know, they should not be trying to teach. And this is an idea that was probably quite prevalent in the 1960s, but it has not completely vanished, including on the Supreme Court. Uh, Justice Clarence Thomas wrote an opinion in a case called uh, Morse versus Frederick that nobody calls Morse versus Frederick, that instead people call bong hits for Jesus. Right. And Because uh, of the sign that you know, somebody was holding. Exactly yeah. right. There was a 14-foot-long banner that a high school senior unfurled that read bong hits for Jesus. And Justice Thomas said, Tinker was wrongly decided. Justice Black was exactly correct. He's an originalist, and he says in the good old days, teachers commanded and students obeyed, and we need to return to this idea. Interestingly, though, Justice Scalia, his fellow originalist at the time, did not sign on to Justice Thomas's opinion, believing that Tinker was wrongly decided, which raises interesting questions about when originalists part company. Yeah, and a theme throughout the book, I mean, you don't, you don't spotlight this, but it comes up over and over again is in recent cases Justice Thomas being often the lone dissenter in these cases, not just challenging the individual issue, but bringing it back to the question about what rights uh, at all students have. Again, with Tinker, students do not have First Amendment rights. Um, and so Thomas wants to challenge this all the way down mm -hmm. and leave maximum discretion to the schools and the local communities um, to fashion their own sort of pedagogical and also moral and ethical mission for the school. He would subscribe pretty heavily to the in loco parentis doctrine where teachers are in effect standing in the shoes of the parents and just as a parent can uh, go search their teenage, teenager's bedroom without violating the Fourth Amendment, a teacher should be able to search a student whenever they wish without r running afoul of the, of the I, did I say right. the Fourteenth Amendment? I mean the Fourth, Fourth Amendment. Right. <laughs> right. But and even in the case of strip searches, right? And this gets us to another section of the, of the book. Um, you spend a lot of time on the Fourth Amendment, uh, search and seizure, also Fifth Amendment, everything from procedural rights um, to, to challenging uh, suspensions. And then you get on to Eighth Amendment, uh, cruel and unusual punishment with corporal punishment. I mean, these are, 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 they raise much different issues, uh, but, but, but extremely challenging cases, often heartbreaking stories. Mm -hmm. But separate from the law, you hear stories of a 13-year-old girl being strip searched uh, in a school to search for prescription pain medication, um, a story of a boy, uh, James Ingram, Ingraham, um, who is uh, paddled to the point that he's in and out of the hospital and, and even after he comes back to school weeks later, he can't. He, he has trouble sitting for yet another week. Um, I mean, just tell us about. I guess the, it's funny. I, I hate putting you on the spot. Your book is full of, you know, probably a hundred interesting cases, all with complicated uh, fact patterns. And so I just keep putting you on the spot. No, no. I tell us talk, about the Ingram case. No, I want to talk about the Ingram case. That's the case that I care the most about oh, in the entire book. Interesting. Uh, it is. Why it, is that? Yeah. So it it raises the issue of corporal punishment and. I think the court was uh, decided the case incorrectly in the 1970s, and it's still an ongoing issue today. Uh, let me start with the Ingram case, and then we'll talk about uh, corporal punishment's stubborn persistence. So yeah, James Ingram is a student in Miami, Florida in 1970. He's on a stage at a high school, uh, pardon me, a junior high school assembly. And he's asked to leave the stage, and he's a little slow to do so. And for that infraction, he's summoned to the principal's office where he's supposed to receive five licks in the parlance. This is a two-foot-long wooden paddle. And when his turn arises, he says, it wasn't me, or offers some form of protest. And for that, uh, some assistant principals grab him and bend him over the desk with one assistant principal is holding his arms, the other is holding his legs, and the principal wields this, uh, this, this, this wooden paddle and strikes him not five times, but 20 times, beating him uh, so savagely that even three days after the fact, there's a six-inch bruise that is tender, swollen, purplish, and also oozing fluid. A, a hematoma. Yes, yeah. exactly right. 
and he's prescribed a battery of sleeping pills, pain relievers, cold compresses, laxatives. Uh, exactly as you say, Adam, he's unable to return to school for two weeks, and it's more than three weeks before he can uh, sit down without experiencing discomfort. It's worth saying that this is an all-black uh, junior high school, Charles R. Drew Junior High School. And this beating of Ingram is part of a larger reign of terror that existed where students were hit for uh, having the wrong socks for gym class, for sitting in the wrong seat, uh, and uh, incredibly minor infractions. There were some what we could regard as mass beatings where some students in the corner are misbehaving and the teacher says, that's it, you're all going to get it and everything, no matter uh, if people were misbehaving. Wow. And, uh, the, and, and incredibly, the school district, in its effort to defend the practice, ended up making matters worse. Uh, there was a high school principal in Miami Beach who said, oh, no, we don't use corporal punishment here. We have a predominantly Jewish population, and they understand oral persuasion. And the implication, of course, is that the students at the all-black Charles R. Drew Junior High School understand brute force. Um, and so uh, the court issues an opinion uh, in a, by Justice Powell. It's a five to four decision saying that this doesn't qualify as punishment for Eighth Amendment purposes under the Cruel and Unusual Punishment Clause. And in effect, he reads uh, language that doesn't exist in the Constitution itself there. He says that it has to be cruel and unusual punishment that stems from a criminal conviction. Oh. Uh, and so that's, uh, a it was a very surprising decision to many people because only a few years earlier, the lower courts got rid of the use of the strap in prisons where, and people thought, well, if you can't hit people who have been convicted of crimes, there's no way you're going to be able to hit public school students. Uh, nevertheless, that's not what the court decided. And so I care about this issue most, again, not because it's merely some sort of historical artifact, but because it's an ongoing phenomenon today. I think that many people are unaware that public schools uh, continue to have corporal punishment. There are 19 states that still have it on the books, uh, but just five states, all located in the South, account for more than 70% of the instances of corporal punishment. So if I have any single hope for this book, it's that it elevates the salience of this issue of corporal punishment and invites the Supreme Court of the United States to revisit this. And I say the Supreme Court of the United States, by the way, because I believe that the jurisdictions that retain this practice at this late date are not going to abandon it on their own. Now, um, moving from such a sort of stark example to maybe the more complicated or, or nuanced examples of just due process, in challenging suspensions, right? If a student is suspended from school for some infraction, to what extent should he have, a, and again, public school, to what extent should he have a constitutional Fifth Amendment right to due process to challenge uh, the, the nature of his suspension? And you talk about a case called Lopez where a student wanted to challenge uh, under the Fifth Amendment his suspension. And you, you mark this as the moment at which the court moves from free speech to broader rights of the Constitution mm -hmm. here due process. So mm -hmm. what happens in that case? Yeah, so uh, Goss versus Lopez arose from a dispute in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, there was gr a great deal of disturbance as a result of a protest surrounding uh, treatment of African American history. It was called Negro History Week back in this day. And there was a sort of mass disturbance and accordingly a mass suspension. The student in question, Dwight Lopez, says that he was not part of the protest and he never had an opportunity to explain himself. And so the Supreme Court in 1975 issues this decision in Goss versus Lopez that affords students some modest due process rights. I mean, incredibly modest. That is to say that all the Supreme Court requires is, in effect, notice of the charges, for lack of a better term, against the student and a brief opportunity to be heard. Mm -hmm. uh, and that satisfies the constitutional requirement. And it's worth saying that this case was decided uh, two years before the James Ingram decision dealing with corporal punishment. And there was a due process claim there. And so people thought, well, if students are afforded due process rights before they're suspended, Surely they're going to get due process rights before they are physically struck. Uh, but the court said no, no due process whatsoever, and said if the beating, in effect, is, is, is savage enough, you will be able to go to state court 
and get some uh, state, uh, some damages from the state and everything. So uh, the Goss versus Lopez is an important decision, not least because it makes clear that Tinker's language about the schoolhouse gate is not going to be confined to the First Amendment, but other constitutional rights uh, are also going to be honored uh, within, within the schoolhouse gate. Now, one of, the, one of the figures that shows up in your book, not in a lawsuit, but just as in the cultural context, is Joe Clark, the principal. Uh, I can't remember the name of the high school, but in Patterson, New Jersey. He's later famously portrayed by Morgan Freeman in a movie. And, and, and Clark sees himself, I mean, he sees himself as a lot of things. He sees himself as a celebrity, and you sort of point this out mm -hmm. in the book at times. Mm -hmm. He seems to sort of be self-aggrandizing. Yes. <laughs> but the, the sort of the general, you know, at its best, Sort of Clark's self-conception was that it was necessary to enforce this, basically the school version of law and order mm -hmm. in order to preserve space for education. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, setting aside some of the more, you know, the, the starker examples of, of paddling and so on, you know, reading your account of Joe Clark and what he was trying to do at that school, actually I thought of in the non-school context, the famous sort of James Q. Wilson and George Kelling theory of mm -hmm. broken windows mm -hmm. policing, the mm -hmm. idea that police officers, cops on the beat, should take extra care to, 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 to look into, prevent, remedy graffiti, broken windows, subway turnstile jumping, precisely because those small infractions Either they lead directly to larger infractions, or they create an environment in which the public in that community thinks that it's OK to commit crime, um, or they fear that the, 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 the police have withdrawn from that area. And so I see the story of Joe Clark and a lot of the other stories of, 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 um, of discipline. Again, not the, 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 the paddling thing, which I found shocking, but, but some of the other things. And I just wonder, to what extent is there sort of a, maybe a broken windows theory of education, right? That, that, that you need to crack down on these small infractions precisely in order to preserve space for all of the students to learn. It's a really good question, Adam. I mean, uh, very insightful. Uh, I was struck reading about Joe Clark. Some of you all are too, too young to remember the movie Lean on Me. Mm -hmm. uh, but he was this incredibly significant educational figure of the 1980s. He's pictured on the cover of Time magazine clutching his Willie Mays baseball bat that he would sort of carry around. And he was known for speaking into a bullhorn and a real sort of authoritarian figure. That's how he's remembered. Was he the one that would announce um, I am the Constitution. I am the Constitution. He would bellow yeah. uh, through the hallways of his high school. Um, and so I read his memoir from this period. And again, he has this reputation as being this real authoritarian figure. And he's saluted by the Reagan administration right. for this and offered positions in domestic policy. And he really is something of a, a, you know, a cultural, like almost like a folk hero or something like that. Yeah. But what I was most struck by in reading his memoir uh, was that he was sort of patting himself on the back, as he was wont to do, but in this time for introducing a new code of discipline, a new take, you know, take no non, a new no-nonsense code of discipline. But the, it had serious infractions there, like bringing a weapon to school or being found with drugs. And what I was most struck by was the default suspension was 10 days for these, what we would regard today as incredibly serious infractions. And so that's to say that uh, these days, these infractions with the rise of zero tolerance policies, which perhaps is right. the strongest uh, echo of uh, broken windows with respect to right. schools, uh, you are suspended not for 10 days or anything like that, but often for the remainder of the school year. And this is something that, uh, you know, affects my own life. I write in the introduction that I was suspended from uh, junior high school and for drinking on an overnight trip. I made a, a mistake as a ninth grader. Uh, I struggle with how I'm going to tell my young children about, you know, why I thought that was a good idea. Um, but I do believe that, um, you know, uh, everybody's success in life is contingent, mine more than most. And had I been expelled for the remainder of the year, I'm quite confident that I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you today. Yeah. And I do encourage schools to revisit some of these um, really aggressive and unforgiving 
disciplinary practices, the, it seems to me that the cost of making an adolescent mistake should not be, you know, many of your life chances going forward. Yeah, reading the, the account of Joe Clark today, you know, decades after that movie, it, just, it occurred to me that in, you know, in more, much more recent political history, there was a popular figure, Sheriff Clark mm -hmm. from Milwaukee, mm -hmm. right, who was, I think this is right, from Milwaukee County, who was uh, famous and wound up on sort of the national stage um, in the media for being for, for really cracking down on crime in mm -hmm. Milwaukee mm -hmm. and sort of an echo of mm -hmm. of, uh, of of again Joe Clark's experience mm -hmm. um, in the schools. Um, I, I could dwell on any of these cases. You just cited so many of them. Um, we have to keep moving. But I notice again in this context, at least in terms of the due process cases, this again is an area where Justice Thomas is one of the court's leading skeptics mm -hmm. that the court should be involved in any of this at all, right? Yeah. Right. He wrote a, uh, an opinion in the Redding case. This is a Fourth Amendment case dealing with a strip search of a junior high school student, which Adam mentioned a moment ago, looking for ibuprofen tablets. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, there was no reason to believe that she had the pills in her undergarments. Other kids had been fa had had been found with the pills, right? Uh huh. Yeah. Yes, other people were found with the pills, and so they searched her backpack. Right. But there was no suggestion that she knew this search was coming. Right. Um, and of course, ibuprofen tablets are not uh, primarily notable for being dangerous drugs, and so the Supreme Court of the United States wrote an opinion that found this strip search of this junior high school student, which she referred to as the most humiliating day of her life, so humiliating that uh, she never returned to the school and subsequently developed ulcers that she attributed to the stress that was brought on by this event. Uh, Justice Thomas uh, disagreed and said that this search should not be regarded as unconstitutional, and he said uh, that this could lead to an epidemic of you know, people crotching, uh, you know, contraband in an effort to avoid detection. It's worth saying that New York City and the great state of Iowa, among other places, we appreciate the, the promotion. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, 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 offered uh, greater protection to students and said that it's always impermissible for for school officials to conduct these sorts of searches. And so that's an important message from the book, that even if uh, the Supreme Court of the United States declines to revisit some of these uh, mistaken decisions, it's important to remember that the Supreme Court of the United States is articulating a constitutional floor below which school districts cannot fall, but nothing prohibits either you know, school districts or state Supreme Courts interpreting the state constitution or as a you know, legislator, school boards from offering greater levels of protection. And that's a dynamic that has uh, been found in the past and that I hope will return again. I mean, just a quick side note. I mean, and this comes up throughout the book. Every time you discuss a case, or almost every time you discuss a case, um, you, you, you look at the reaction among law, law professors, among the, the press. You're always looking back at how the local and national press are evaluating what the court has done, um, and then also state legislatures, especially when, even when the court, as, is, as you say, prescribes the floor or doesn't recognize a right at all, oftentimes it's the state legislatures that then jump in, not necessarily in the state that gave rise to the conflict, obviously, but other states, once the issue's been elevated into the Supreme Court or elevated by the Supreme Court or elevated by a dissenting judge on the Supreme Court, uh, then sometimes politics is changed by the fact of that litigation. Yeah, that's exactly right. A good example of this phenomenon is in response to the San Antonio Independent School District versus Rodriguez decision. That's a case where people in San Antonio, Texas sought to challenge the way in which schools are funded by property tax. And the Supreme Court of the United States in a five to four decision rejected that claim uh, students in Edgewood, the poor part of town, received a lot less money per pupil than students in Alamo Heights, the wealthy part of town. Uh, many people thought, by the way, at the time, that the court was likely to vindicate such a claim. My predecessor at the University of Chicago, Professor Philip Curlin, said, I should tell you 
Uh, that it's only a matter of time before the Warren Court is going to honor uh, this sort of claim. And this was not a prospect that he relished by any stretch of the imagination. It didn't turn out that way. Uh, justice, uh, you know, the court rejected the claim. Justice Thurgood Marshall, in the 100th and final footnote of his opinion, uh, says you've lost in federal court, but there's nothing that prohibits you from turning to state courts. And that was an effort that was successful in Texas uh, and many other states besides. Uh, and so it takes a long period of time for this to unfold, uh, where oftentimes the state Supreme Court will tell the state legislature, no, that's not good enough, that's not equitable enough, take another crack at it. Uh, but ultimately, they do win. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's an important phenomenon. Yeah. And on that theme, there's a great new book out, I guess it came out a few months ago, by Judge Jeffrey Sutton of the Sixth Circuit where he talks about the ways in which the state legislatures and state courts sometimes end up following behind the Supreme Court when the Supreme Court doesn't recognize a particular right and either the state democratic process or the state judicial process under its own constitution yes. will then fill in what, what that particular state sees as, as a gap. Yes. Um, in, in the strip search case, you know, we, we keep talking back to, to autobiography in some ways. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's a case, as you highlight, Justice Ginsburg plays a particular role, um, a particularly important role, because in that case, when it's her, there's only one woman on the Supreme Court. Yes. And Justice Ginsburg, uh, she concludes that some of her colleagues are not sufficiently attentive to the interests of the woman student in, the class, mm -hmm. in this case, um, because they grew up as boys, not girls. Mm -hmm. and, in that, and we know that she has these feelings because she takes the extraordinary step of actually giving an interview just two weeks or so after oral argument, long before the court ever decides the case. Uh, and she makes some, some pretty strong statements to, I think, maybe Joan Biskupic or yes. a reporter. Um, could you talk a little bit about that incident? Yeah, it was a very unusual thing for a Supreme Court justice to have an interview about a pending case yeah. expressing, in effect, frustration with her colleagues, where she says, uh, she's the only woman at the court, and uh, my male colleagues, they, were, they don't know what it's like to be a 13-year-old girl, she says, uh, to be developing at that time. It's just an intensely uh, sort of self-conscious time. Yeah. Not, not to interrupt, but it comes up a little bit at oral argument, right? Justice Breyer asks a question, sort of reflecting on his own experience. You know, I was a, you know, I was a kid, I was a boy, 13 years old, I had to change in the locker room. And he sort of, he makes a comment that comes out the wrong way, and the room kind of laughs. And even Justice Ginsburg, I guess, chuckles a little bit. But the, the, the view from the press that by the end of her argument is that she was very frustrated with the tenor of the oral argument for exactly that reason. That's exactly right. And so she takes this step and speaks to the press. And, uh, you know, I have great admiration for uh, Justice Ginsburg, including in her pioneering work with the ACLU Women's Rights Project. I don't applaud her uh, taking this approach, not because of a breach of sort of court decorum, right. but instead, uh, it doesn't seem to me that her being a 13-year-old girl is necessary in order to be sensitive to how it feels to be searched. That is to say that I think there are many 13-year-old boys uh, who would feel uncomfortable stripping down to their underwear for a strip search under suspicion of wrongdoing. And so if her male colleagues uh, could not understand that, that's a real poverty of imagination on uh, their part. And I, uh, you know, criticize Justice Ginsburg because one of the principles that I admire most is this idea of uh, what's been called the anti-stereotype principle, right. where she says that you know some women, many women, want to work outside of the home. Some men want to be, uh, you know, child caregivers or or home, you know, uh, people who work in the home. And you should not, because of stereotypes that exist in the larger society, be inhibited in this way. But I found her comments uh, to be uh, of a stereotyped nature. That is to say, it speaks young women's fragility and uh, sort of boys who are insensitive to incursions on their privacy. And what is that other than a stereotype notion? So while we may understand Ginsburg uh, speaking in an effort to reach the result that she wished to achieve uh, while the case was still pending, she's doubled down on these sorts of statements even after the opinion. And I would wish her to speak in a more broad way to say that this sort of search 
uh, it should be impermissible, and it doesn't matter whether you're 13 or 18. Um, and I should say that these strip searches happen with some regularity, including when there's money that's missing sometimes in classrooms. They will march the students uh, into bathrooms, and they will c uh, conduct these strip searches. And so yeah. hopefully the Reading case will bring that practice to a close. Well, we have time for audience questions. So if you have any, just I want to say just one other thing. There's so much in the book we haven't even gotten to. Um, the last part of your book, the title, it's a, it's a great title of the chapter. You call it The Quiet Detente Over Religion and Education. Um, and another issue we've not even touched on, but of course it's the most famous Supreme Court case, and, and also the most famous Supreme Court case on education, Brown v. Board of Education. We have this whole line of, of questions about race yeah. and equal protection. And it's something that, we, well, you mentioned in sort of your describing your background, you said you went to an all, did you say, I, no, no, it wasn't, it wasn't your background. It was the, 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 the James Ingram's mm -hmm. school was all, all black students, yes. you said. Not, a seg not, not, not because it was segregated by race, right, but because that's just, I mean, that, that, that's how, I mean, how would you describe it, I guess? That, the residential housing yeah. patterns and the existence of racialized ghettos in the country yeah. create racially isolated schools. And so there's been Supreme Court cases about that. There's perennially litigation about affirmative action, um, and including this case at Harvard now. Yes. I mean, it, since it is in the news, I'm just curious, do you have any thoughts on the on the, the Harvard affirmative action case? I do, uh, yes. Um, you know, uh, affirmative action has been administered last rights many times, you know, uh, since 1978 in the Bakke opinion. Lewis Powell was an improbable savior of affirmative action. Mm -hmm. My old boss, Justice O'Connor, would have been regarded as an improbable savior of affirmative action. She said in 2003 that she expected that affirmative action would have maybe 25 years to go, and we're now 10 years away from that, that deadline. That's exactly right. At the time that she uttered that statement, she says, it's been 25 years since Bakke in 2003, and another 25 years we won't need it. Uh, 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 supporters of affirmative action at the time in 2003 thought, what do you mean 25 years? <laughs> That's not nearly long enough. I suspect that many supporters of affirmative action uh, would leap at that deal for another 10 years at this time. That is to say that uh, many people believe that affirmative action's days are numbered. I suspect that uh, Kavanaugh has a uh, more, uh, more colorblind constitutional approach to these questions than did Kennedy. Uh, when Kavanaugh was in private practice, he wrote an op-ed for the Wall Street Journal about a case called Rice versus Cayetano, where he quoted with approval a uh, statement from Justice Scalia taking a very sort of jaundiced approach to race conscious decision making. And so um, I, I think that it's quite probable that Kennedy, uh, pardon me, that Kavanaugh would join a five, uh, you know, uh, four colleagues in order to uh, invalidate affirmative action. I think that this is an issue that sits high atop. Uh, Chief Justice Roberts's agenda, such as it is, he's right. one of the most powerful and passionate opinions that he wrote was in the Parents Involved in Community Schools case that, where he wrote the single most famous line that he's written where he says, uh, the way to stop discrimination on the basis of race is to stop discriminating on the basis of race. Right, whereas the justice that Kavanaugh is replacing his own mentor, Kennedy, at times was a critic of affirmative action, but in the last major case, he decided the second iteration of the Fisher case. Did he write the majority? I think he wrote the majority yes. opinion, really saving yes. Texas's yes. University of Texas. Actually, we're used to teach the University of Texas's yes. um, affirmative action program. It's, it's really interesting. Kennedy, um, I'm, a case that I write about in the book is called Parents Involved in Community Schools, which was decided when I was a law clerk at the court. Chief Justice Roberts writes one opinion. My old boss, Justice Breyer, writes another opinion. And Kennedy tried to find some common ground. Uh, uh, sorry, middle ground, not common ground. He was writing only for himself. Right. And he did a very interesting thing where he was with Roberts, where he says, these programs in Louisville and Seattle that are voluntary inter integration programs must fall because they racially classify individual students. Uh, but he did simultaneously say, uh, that the Constitution does not require colorblindness. And most people collapse those two ideas together, right, to say that to be anti-classification also requires colorblindness. And Kennedy pulled them apart. 
And he said that schools could take account of the racial demographics of cities uh, in drawing district boundaries in a particular way to achieve greater amounts of racial integration. Or when they are deciding where to build a school in the city, they can take account of the racial demographics of the city. And I do believe that that opinion and parents involved uh, was his first step toward where he would ultimately end up in the Fisher II case as however grudgingly uh, upholding the legitimacy of race conscious admissions practices at the University of Texas. Yeah, and ironically, it was it, the approach in that case was one that was in, in some ways expressly deferential to the school's own concept mm -hmm. of, of its educational mission mm -hmm. and how best to pursue that through diversity. Mm -hmm. not, in, not entirely deferential, but somewhat deferential. So you, at the end, you get this sort of ironic reversal, mm -hmm. right, where, where, where a, a, a policy really championed but by first and foremost by the, by, by progressives mm -hmm. was being achieved now through deference mm -hmm. to in mm -hmm. a way to mm -hmm. the educational mission mm -hmm. where in a way at the outset of this history we've been charting for the last hour it was progressives pushing back against deference yes to the educational yeah that's exactly right um, Justice Breyer's opinion did speak in the language of deference when it came to parents involved and uh, Judge Wilkinson of the Fourth Circuit wrote a piece on the Harvard Law Review where he said that in effect Justice Breyer is channeling what have been conservative arguments about local control and you know we should defer to the local school board uh, on these sorts of questions. It's worth saying that uh, Justice Powell in the 1970s said at one point that schools taking steps to achieve greater amounts of racial integration is not merely permissible under the Constitution, uh, but is required under yeah. the 14th Amendment. But we are very far away from that time now. Uh, Judge Wilkinson, by the way, I think is the, pre the, the last speaker in the series. Oh, is that right? He's here to discuss his right. book this summer. Um, well, thank you all for being so patient. Sir, did you have your hand up, and then you, sir, and then you, ma'am? Yeah, hi. I'm Mike Irocious. You mentioned about Justice Ginsburg um, talking to the press. Mm -hmm. uh, before a case is really decided. Do other justices do this? Is this mm -hmm. like she's taking her, her opinion to the court of public opinion and maybe trying to sway the other justices? Is that ethical or appropriate? Mm. And Justice Ginsburg, again, I guess in the last presidential election, mm. she ran into a little mm -hmm. uh, criticism even from the New York Times on mm -hmm. her, her sort of comments about the the political campaign. Yeah. yeah, it's a very unusual move for a uh, justice to take the case to the press. Um, you know, uh, I suppose if you squint, you can see uh, potentially other related issues, even if not about pending cases. For example, to refer to something that we spoke about a while ago. Uh, between the Gobitis decision in 1940 and the Barnett decision in 1943, there were some justices who were in effect saying, we got it wrong in Gobitis after this raft of violence came. And so while there was no case technically pending, they were in effect you know, sort of telegraphing uh, what they would be likely to do. And you do uh, see, and this is an increasing phenomenon in recent years, where yeah. justices will in effect be able to you know, call for cert petitions and everything. And so maybe that would be regarded. But it is, as I say, highly unusual for a justice to take that step. And it must be indicative of uh, she must have thought that things are blowing in the wrong direction here. And she was, in effect, trying to mount maybe public pressure uh, from the justices. And who knows, maybe the women in their lives or their daughters to say, hey, this is a serious case, and you guys are on the verge of getting it very wrong. In the end, of course, it ended up not coming out that way. I'll leave it for you all to decide whether but she was effective or what. Had an occurred with it. Maybe she, it was a bank shot. Uh, through the press mm -hmm. to the spouses of some mm -hmm. of our colleagues. That, mm -hmm. that would be something. Sir? Thank you very much. Okay, Brian Benson, uh, just, just to repeat, I did work at the Hoover Institution Stanford many, many years ago. I have a couple of free speech type questions, but let me say first, in my mind, if, when we look at, at education, we can think of it as a quadrant. Uh, there's public uh, L high, private L high, public higher ed, and private higher ed. So my, right. my question is, is within that context. Looking at the issue of free speech in private El High, I'm wondering if you could say something of compare and contrast between the court's opinions as the two. I, spe 
specific example jumps to mind. Suppose there's an El High military academy that wants to insist that all students salute the flag every morning. Is that, you know, what happens to that because it's at a, at a private institution? Um, and then in the higher education realm, I think there are now uh, a couple of some cases where higher education higher education institutions are setting aside so-called safe spaces where people who don't want to hear controversial discussion can can retire to um, and I'm wondering what kind of a how, how the court decisions um, you've been discussing would bear on that at the higher ed level and also private versus public yeah so uh, good question uh, private institutions uh, are not going to need to comply with the uh, Constitution of the United States. And so if you send your child to a private institution, they can uh, do what they wish with respect to requiring the Pledge of Allegiance or, say, school uniforms, right, or dress codes where people do bring claims that generally lose under the First Amendment or the 14th Amendment and liberty about school uniforms, that claim wouldn't go anywhere whatsoever if you send your kid to a private institution. Um, you know, uh, there's been a lot of attention that has been paid to uh, campus matters, which I think of as higher education and all of the disputes when speakers are invited to campus and the sort of unrest that we've seen at many institutions. Adam and I were just talking uh, before we came on, and I said that I fear that there is a connection between what's happening in our K through 12 schools and some of the hostility to the free exchange of ideas uh, that exist on our college campuses. That is to say uh, that, in my view, too much student speech is suppressed in the K through 12 environment, and that leaves students ill prepared to be able to engage in the free exchange of ideas. And so let me put a little bit of flesh on the bones there. I mean, the Tinker case, was a real step forward. The, the test that was articulated was that if there's, uh, if teachers have a, um, uh, if there's, uh, if they reasonably fear a substantial disruption of schoolwork or other school activities, then it's permissible to punish the speech. Again, that was a real step forward, but the problem with that is that it reads into the freedom of speech and student speech what's called a heckler's veto. This is the idea that particularly sensitive listeners can, if they object vociferously enough, silence otherwise legitimate speech. And so we see this phenomenon uh, at issue in our schools, including in some litigation. There was a case out of California where students who were wearing clothing featuring the American flag were told that they could not do so and that they had to turn their shirts inside out. This was on May the 5th a.k.a. Cinco de Mayo, and there were students saying, you know, what's the matter? You don't like Mexicans and, and this sort of thing. And so the Ninth Circuit issued a decision saying it was permissible to tell these students to wear the clothing featuring the American flag, and they had to turn it inside out. Uh, and so that seemed to be a classic heckler's veto problem. There are cases going the other way, and I hope that lower courts will do this. Let me just tell you one example. Um, in a case out of the 1980s, out of uh, Rhode Island, there's a guy called Aaron Fricky who wanted to bring uh, another young man to uh, the prom as his date. And the school says, oh no, that's too hot a topic. There's been some unrest over issues of sexual orientation in our school. We can't guarantee your safety. And the district court said, no, that's not permissible. That There's an expressive component here. And you're not going to be able to shut down who he wishes to bring as his date. And so I think that that's a much stronger uh, approach to these issues of freedom of speech. And I wish that the Ninth Circuit would have cited the fricky opinion in order to say that students should be able to wear these. I understand the frustration on, part, on the part of Mexican-American students, uh, but the solution there for school administrators should be to talk to the students, try to calm them down. And if anyone's going to be disciplined, it seems to me the students who are threatening violence and unrest should be the ones who are disciplined, uh, even if they are uh, responding to some sort of, I suppose, in my view, pretty mild provocation. Yeah, and on the, the, the sort of helpful quadrant you sketched out, just to be very clear, your book focuses on public education 
in elementary and secondary schools, and you observe that university campuses are, are, are related, but, but sort of parceled off, and private schools as well. I remember when I, having gone to a Catholic school, I was an editor of the high school newspaper, and the principal actually pulled one of our newspapers mm. for in, for reasonable reasons. Um, <laughs> it, well, it, it's nothing scandalous. It was there was a there was a at the end of the year there was a photo of some you know end of year issue photos and prominently we realized after we printed up the copies prominently in one of the photos was a student who had committed suicide during mm. the year mm. and the and the principal decided that it was best to take that out and it, we never questioned it because it was private school and then right. I, a year later I was at the college newspaper at the University of Iowa and said, wait a second, we have what rights? Um, <laughs> um, not questioning the principal's judgment then, but saying, oh, this really is very different. Yeah. Um, uh, Ma'am? And then, and then next, sir. Hi, I'm uh, Margo Tersek. I was wondering, I was, I was struck by something you said, that uh, one of the justices in their decision said that schools are responsible for creating citizens. And um, I was also thinking of the Plyler decision, which holds that undocumented students have a right to an education. Mm -hmm lest there be sort of this permanent underclass mm -hmm. of American residents who are uneducated and illiterate. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, how do you reconcile those, that case and that belief with the Rodriguez case that decided that you know, vast and appalling disparities in educational mm -hmm. quality and funding mm -hmm. on the basis of you know, a community's socioeconomic status are not a violation of constitutional right. rights? How do you reconcile those, those two cases? And do you think the Rodriguez case was wrongly decided? No. Very interesting question. So thinking about Rodriguez and Plyler side by side, I write about both of these cases at length in the book. And Plyler in particular is a case of great fascination for me. Justice Powell, by the way, in effect holds the controlling vote in both the Rodriguez decision and the Plyler decision. He writes the Rodriguez decision dealing with school funding and then joins uh, Justice Brennan's opinion in Plyler versus Doe. And uh, Powell could be understood to be consistent, uh, even though he alone uh, sort of uh, was with the majority in both cases. The way that he could be consistent is that he holds out the possibility in the Rodriguez decision uh, that uh, the, he says that students are not uh, wholly uh, excluded from schools. It's not that they get no money whatsoever. They get uh, less money per pupil. But it's not to say that they get no money whatsoever. Whereas, of course, in Plyler versus Doe, we are dealing with a regime where students are excluded from the schools altogether. Um, you know, I write about the Plyler versus Doe decision. Um, uh, because many constitutional law professors have said that the decision was not very important, and the way that they get there is through this idea of constitutional outliers. They say, rightly, we need to pay attention to how common a practice is, rather than just saying the Supreme Court decisions changed everything under the sun. And so Texas was the only state in the nation that had a statute in this way at the time. But I would regard the Texas uh, statute as being uh, the first of what would have become many. I think of it as an upstart. And the Supreme Court, in effect, nips, in effect, nips that legislation in the bud. Uh, I don't think it's compelling to say that only those, those cowboys down in Texas would be attracted to this. We know very well today that anxieties about unauthorized immigrants are far from confined to the nation's border. And so there's no doubt in my mind that many states uh, would have adopted these practices. Indeed, California passed a measure, Alabama passed a measure, and many other states would have uh, in the absence of the Plyler versus Doe decision. So regardless of whether you think that's correctly decided or incorrectly decided, it has been an efficacious decision in the sense that uh, millions of people have uh, been able to receive an education who otherwise would not have been able to do so. Uh, the, you asked about the San Antonio Ind Independent School District versus the Rodriguez decision and you know, whether it was correct or incorrect. I can say President Obama, when he was a state legislator, a state legislator said that he thought that it was correctly decided, actually. Um, and uh, he was appearing to promote dreams from my father on a local television show. And I suspect that his biggest ambition at the time was not to be president of the United States, but to be mayor of Chicago. And he said, um, you know, as a state legislator and as a law professor, 
you know, the judiciary is just not good at this sort of thing. They shouldn't be sticking their hands in the, uh, in, in effect, the government's pocket and telling them how to spend this money. And so, you know, I think it's really interesting that he did not have a big problem with the Rodriguez decision. And I can say that in 1973, there were four votes to say that this violates the federal constitution. And, um, and, and I don't know if there's a single vote for that proposition on the current Supreme Court if it were to make its way up there. So that's what I feel comfortable saying. Uh, yes, sir. It, just a quick question regarding the line of free speech cases you're talking about in public high schools. Mm -hmm. uh, most of these cases, starting with Tinker, are quite old. I'm wondering if you think that some of the advancements in, say, neuroscience, where we're learning more and more about brain development and you know the, the development of adolescent intelligence and brains, should affect the outcome in cases going forward, because we commonly limit rights in, in, in light of the ability to intelligently exercise them? That is a terrific question, really terrific question. So just so everybody's on board here, um, there have been developments with respect to cognitive understanding and those uh, of, of adolescence. And those uh, developments have appeared in the Supreme Court's jurisprudence as well, right? Thinking about uh, the culpability of adolescents for committing crimes, and the court has said it's illegitimate uh, to have, say, life without parole as a sentence for someone because of uh, the way that the brain, such as it is, is not fully developed. And so the question here is a very clever one in the sense that it says, doesn't that unsettle some of these uh, precedents? After all, um, if uh, students don't have, you know, fully developed brains, then why should they have uh, these First Amendment rights? And you could imagine going to other rights as well. Uh, one of the, the uh, leading uh, scientists in this area who the Supreme Court has relied upon in these criminal cases is a, is a man called Lawrence Steinberg of Temple, I believe. And he has this really evocative metaphor where he says that the adolescent brain is a bit like a car that is equipped with a really sensitive gas pedal and really terrible brakes, right? Uh, the idea is that you know, students can you know, go really fast, sometimes get upset, say, right, and everything, and have difficulty slowing down and everything. And so maybe uh, there's some force to this idea that uh, Tinker uh, you know, has been unsettled unknowingly. Um, you know, I think that. Uh, we're talking about different realms here, and so I don't think that uh, Tinker should be reversed as a result of these more recent decisions. It's important to bear in mind that uh, the rights that are afforded in Tinker are very modest in comparison to what students have outside of the schoolhouse, right, where, where students, with the exception of obscenity, are going to enjoy First Amendment rights that are virtually coextensive with those of adults. Um, and, you know, it's worth, again, thinking about the context where if we are trying to cultivate citizens who are going to be engaged in a uh, democracy where disagreeing with people is uh, an important part of our society, then I want them to begin that process uh, in the schools. So I think that, as I've said, that the context matters. And when you're thinking about criminal culpability, uh, that is a different matter than, say, the freedom of speech. But it's a very perceptive, astute question, so I'm grateful to you for it. Now, I want to get back to those themes as we close. But beforehand, there is one sort of other random question that I've had in my mind. Just reading the book, you know, we, we, you mentioned sort of your autobiography and, and, and Justice Ginsburg. You know, she sort of reflects on her autobiography. You know, every time we saw Justice Thomas pop up as the lone dissenter, I thought of his own personal story. Mm -hmm which he's outlined in his book, My Grandfather's Son, mm -hmm. his autobiography. I wonder, how much does Justice Thomas's, I mean, we're just speculating now, but Justice Thomas's own unique story, what does that, to what extent might that inform his view of the need for schools to have broad latitude to govern students in education, right? He came from a very, he came from an impoverished family, mm -hmm. a broken family, mm -hmm. uh, wound up being taught eventually um, by the priests, right? Mm -hmm. He went to a Catholic yeah. school um, and then to Holy Cross. 
And I wonder to what extent is Justice Thomas's own sort of unique voice on the court informed by his own experience and his view of what that experience in a very controlled environment did for his own personal formation and which you know you mentioned you your, your long subway and bus rides and walks out of your community your, your home your neighborhood to Northwest right Justice Thomas's own personal journey mm -hmm. from from his impoverished beginnings mm -hmm. to his education mm -hmm. I wonder if he sees that as being necessary to to help him escape what he saw as a broken community and home. It's a very interesting question. Um, he has written this moving biography, uh, the circumstances in which he you know, grew up in Pinpoint, Georgia are uh, unimaginable. He says with some force that he uh, didn't think that he would ever see the Supreme Court of the United States, uh, let alone be on it from his youth. And that was, the smart, that was where the smart money was. Uh, and I am sympathetic to this idea that maybe some of the relatively austere uh, circumstances, uh, including you know a very strict disciplinarian as a grandfather, right. he feels was uh, uh, essential for his acquiring discipline on his own. And so it's possible he thinks that if their public schools had greater amounts of you know, more uh, you know, severe and, and disciplinary an approach that people would be better. One area where I do believe that Justice Thomas's own experiences do very much inform his jurisprudence would be with respect to uh, the, you know, the legitimacy or the illegitimacy, in his case, of affirmative action, right, right. right? Where he does talk about his own experience at Yale Law School, which was a uh, mm -hmm. sort of trying one at best. Um, and he's a very interesting person, including in the parents involved opinion. He's quite different from many of his colleagues in the sense that uh, many of his colleagues who are skeptical of affirmative action have been paying attention to what we would call white victims uh, who are denied admission. And that's not where Thomas's focus is. He's paying attention to the black community. And he right. says these supposed beneficiaries are, in fact, victimized by this process. Um, and, uh, you know, he very interestingly scrambles the usual dichotomy in the 14th Amendment, where we learned in law school, either you're anti-classification or you're anti-subordination. And if you're anti-classification, then affirmative action must go. But if you're anti-subordination, then it's possible that affirmative action programs can be. Most of Thomas's colleagues are anti-classification. Thomas is anti-classification, but he's also anti-subordination. Right. Right. And he claims that mantle by saying, uh, that the real issue here is that you are trying to have black students go to school with white students because you believe the lie that black students left to their own devices cannot learn in really powerful ways. And so he elevates the old M Street High School in Washington, D.C. as an example of both all black and excellent. And so, um, you know, many people dismiss uh, Justice Thomas as you know, an Uncle Tom or a sellout, and I think those folks don't know what they're talking about and have not read the opinions. I don't share his views, um, but he is speaking in a tradition of the black community that is awfully reminiscent, I say in the book, of black power and you know, sort of Stokely Carmichael, aka Kwame Ture, uh, where, and indeed Derrick Bell as well, so uh, who are really skeptical of the sort of integrationist imperative. Right, in a way, Justice Thomas inverts the, usual, the way we usually, you know, proponents of affirmative action think about diversity by saying, essentially, Bakke's, the, the case of Bakke, its diversity rationale, um, which was then later endorsed by the full court, uh, it makes African American students, in a way, not just an end in and of themselves, but also a means to an end mm -hmm. of school diversity, mm -hmm. which again is a, is a, is a, is a, is a, a salutary end. Mm -hmm. But it's Justice Thomas's argument that actually comes at great cost to those students. I mean, and then you named all the figures who he, actually, he in many ways evokes in his own writing in these opinions. He's quoting Frederick Douglass, mm -hmm. right, and saying yes. you know, Douglass's famous quote. What, 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 do, what does the black community want? Well, it wants to be left alone. Mm -hmm. um, I, I will say about Justice Thomas's book, the only thing better than reading it is listening to the audiobook version, which he reads himself, mm -hmm. which is just incredibly powerful. Mm -hmm. um, but OK, enough about Justice Thomas's book. Let's finish talking about your book again. Okay. Um, you start the book setting the scene for all of this, again, with sort of the prehistory of all of this. And you quote the journalist Walter Lippmann mm -hmm. um, early in your book, you know, a nearly century old quote now 
But you know, as you describe the public schools as the single most significant site of constitutional interpretation within the nation's history. But then you quote Lippmann to say that the schools are a site for a, a, a broader struggle. And this is just these two quotes. You quote Lippmann, he says, the struggles for the control of the schools are among the bitterest political struggles. And then he adds, it is inevitable that it should be. Uh, wherever two or more groups within a state differ in religion or in language or in nationality, the immediate concerns of each group is to use the schools to preserve its own faith and tradition. Um, it's impossible to read that quote without thinking about uh, our current political environment, our current cultural environment. One, in, you know, in many ways, uh, either we are polarized or it feels that we're polarized. Um, even within a red state or a blue state, there's, there's, there's strong, often bitter divide within communities over what the values of that community are. And it all comes then back into schools. And as a national community, the same thing. One of the reasons why schools are incre were one of the leading battlegrounds over emerging issues over gender identity, yes. um, over the, the, the sexual assault, and, and, and so on. Um, and so that Lippmann quote is, is, is so powerful. I mean, do you think, should we expect the school situation to get worse, these, 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 these debates to get worse, as the political climate becomes uh, more bitter? You know, it's, uh, it's an arresting quote that Lippmann offers, uh, but in its own way, I draw some measure of hope from his relatively grave diagnosis of how this is always going to be a battleground. And one of the reasons I'm glad to be here with you today is because I'm interested in trying to identify common ground between liberals and the libertarian inflected vision of constitutional law that is ascendant in some right-leaning circles. And I want to identify a few different areas you know, before right. we wrap up. I think that the freedom of speech involving student speech is one area where that coalition may be able to find common ground. Uh, the corporal punishment issue, which I spoke about before, if you're a libertarian, you have to have some skepticism of the state's authority as it exercises dominion over an individual in a really profound way. The Fourth Amendment is another area, and I have in mind particularly suspicionless drug searches where people are required to hand over a specimen. Um, and I think that well, should be uh, as a condition for being in an extracurricular for, activity. For participating in extracurricular activities. The idea being you have to be at school, but you don't have to be on the marching band or whatever. So therefore, we can require you to hand over a urine sample. Yeah, exactly right. And so I hope that those are three areas where liberals and libertarians will be able to come together. The other thing that the Lippmann quotation prompts for me is uh, the way in which you referred to earlier in our time, what I call the quiet detente uh, over religion in public schools. And so Lippmann was talking a lot about religion in the way this is always going to be a contentious area, but I, it's my argument that it's been relatively quiet over the last couple of decades. Obviously, in the early 1960s, when the court invalidates teacher-sponsored uh, prayer, uh, those decisions were incredibly unpopular, and they remain so today. Nevertheless, I don't see a lot of acrimony, and I attribute that to a number of different factors, including the rise of homeschooling, mm -hmm. the legitimation of school vouchers, a decision that I think uh, was uh, correctly decided to say that it did not violate the Establishment Clause, and these other things. And so this is to say uh, that religion is no longer the sort of battleground over public schools, and I hope that that will remain true going forward. Yeah. And just one last question, and we can't possibly do it justice, um, but the other, one of the other, other quotes at the outset of your book is from Alexis de Tocqueville. His fan, anytime I see Tocqueville pop up, I, I, you know, I, I, I'm happy to see it. Mm -hmm. You say his famous line, scarcely a political issue arises in the country that doesn't eventually become litigation, mm -hmm. and loosely translated. Um, and that's right, and one of the reasons why so many of these cultural issues then wind up in the courts um, through, the, through the schools. But then I thought of another Tocqueville quote I've been, I've been spending a lot of time thinking about recently mm -hmm. in the same his famous book. He says this, One cannot doubt that in the United States the instruction of the people serves powerfully to maintain a democratic republic. It will be so, I think, everywhere that the instruction that enlightens the mind is not separated from the education that regulates mores or values. Um, from Tocqueville's time to ours, 
there's always this challenge of to what extent the schools should be inculcating values, to what extent that inculcation of values is necessary for the, 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 the continuation of a healthy republic. And some of the questions touched on this a little bit in the course of our discussion, right? The extent to which um, the schools need to maintain and promote certain values precisely so that the public going forward, once you, these students graduate from school or, or finish school and go on to become just members of the, of the participating democracy, right, the extent to which they'll be prepared to be in some way responsible stewards of that democracy. Now, the way I just described it, some would say that's completely paternalistic, right? It's not the place of the schools to decide what kind of citizens we should have. Um, but one way or another, the schools are going to teach values. And so I, I grapple with this constantly as a, a proponent of free speech in schools. And as we were discussing beforehand, I'm on the board of a new group called Speech First, which is you know, fighting for free speech on campus. Um, but in all of this, I always think, yes, but the schools do play this fundamental role, wanted or unwanted, as forming the citizens. Mm -hmm. um, and I just, I guess my last question is, can the, can the schools play that role and, and forcefully play that role without limiting mm. the, 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 the contrary speech within mm -hmm. the, the, the elementary classroom? Mm. Yeah, I think that schools are, as you suggested, inevitably going to inculcate values to students. And the question is, which values are they going to inculcate? And part of the way that they do so is through their own example. And I would worry about a school system that uh, did not, in the public school context, honor, say, free speech as being a vital part of our democratic process. Um, I do see too often uh, students wish to speak up against the school and its message. And I think that's an important part of the legitimacy of speaking out against your government. And I'll give you an example of a student who wished to wear a t-shirt during a day of silence about sort of the violence that's visited on our gay brothers and sisters. And he wanted to wear a t-shirt that said, Romans 127, you know, do not accept what God has condemned. I disagree with the message that he uh, sought to promote, but it was a day of silence that was, in effect, sponsored by the school, and he wished to say that he disagreed with the school's message. And I think that he should have been able to do that, and one of the reasons I think that he should have been able to do that is because um, I couldn't think of another way that he could express that view that he disagreed with the school, that is to say, the government's message. Um, he, is, he did not want to wear a t-shirt that said straight pride. Uh, he thought that homosexuality is a sin, and that's the view that he wanted to communicate. And I like to think that what would happen there would be that his fellow students uh, would engage him and tell him that they disagreed. And there, one of the things that it makes me think of is that, you know, in Tinker, they were surely promoting a minority viewpoint uh, and one that the school uh, did not wish to uh, agree with. And so I believe that uh, that is foundational for our uh, democracy and that we need to do a better job of uh, disagreeing, including in the public schools, without people becoming completely divided and polarizing. Well, I encourage everybody to, 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 to find and read this wonderful book, The Schoolhouse Gate. Um, thank you all for joining us today. And thank you, most of all, uh, to Professor Driver for, for joining us. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. I really appreciate you all being here.